I call to order the Gladstone City Council work session for Tuesday, May 23rd, 2023. It's 5.31 p.m. Um, the City of Gladstone is abiding by guidelines set forth in House Bill 2560, which requires the governing body of the public body to the extent reasonably possible to make all meetings accessible remotely through technological means and provide opportunity for members of the general public to remotely submit oral and written testimony during meetings to the extent in-person oral and written testimony is allowed. Since this is a work session, oral and written testimony from the general public will not be included in tonight's meeting. So this meeting is open to the public, both in person and virtually using the Zoom platform and the Zoom instructions were printed on the agenda. Uh, will you call the roll, please? Councillor Huckabee. Present. Councillor Alexander. Yes. Councillor Reichel. Present. Councillor Cook. Present. Councillor Roberts. Present. Councillor Garlington. Present. Let's stand for the flag. Oh, here. <laughs> Let's stand for the flag salute. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, we have three items on our agenda tonight for the work session. Uh, we will dis be discussing a proposed new intergovernmental agreement with the City of Gladstone and the Oak Lodge Water Services relating to water, wastewater, and stormwater. Then we have a joint work session with the Senior Center Advisory Board to discuss changing the name of the Gladstone Senior Center. And we will conclude with the discussion of the inflow and infiltration, also known as I&I &I, reduction project in accordance with the memo of understanding with the Department of Environmental Quality, DEQ. So uh, item number one, uh, staff. Thank you, Mayor, and good evening, City Council. We have guests that I'm gonna ask to come up to the table. We have Sarah Joe, we have Brad, and we have Tommy from Oak Lodge Water Services. And on Zoom, we have City Attorney Ashley Driscoll joining us. And to my right, we have our Public Works Director, Darren Canaparoli. And I, I wanted to, to start out by saying that uh, we've been working on this agreement for five years. And we've gone through two Public Works Directors and Oak Lodge has gone through two engineers. And we're very excited about the work that's gone into this. And I think that because it is so comprehensive, if you will afford me an opportunity, I'm going to read through some important notes in the staff report for the record tonight. And so what we are here for is to review a proposed new intergovernmental agreement with the city of Gladstone and Oak Lodge Water Services relating to water, wastewater and stormwater. Oak Lodge Water Services and Gladstone have adjacent and overlapping territorial boundaries. Within those boundaries, each entity operates a water and a wastewater collection system and manages stormwater. Territorial boundaries and utility systems have evolved over time and Oak Lodge Water Services and Gladstone have generally worked together to build their utility systems in an efficient manner throughout their combined territories. As a result, portions of Gladstone's water utility system serve customers located within Oak Lodge Water Services territorial jurisdiction and portions of Oak Lodge Water Systems water utility system serve customers located within Gladstone's territorial jurisdiction. The wastewater collection systems of each entity are interconnected with the vast majority of wastewater in these areas flowing to Oak Lodge Water Systems treatment plant. Those areas not flowing to Oak Lodge Water flow to West, as we learned in our educational session that we had last month. For stormwater, Gladstone has primary responsibility for managing stormwater runoff from the rights of way it controls, 
whereas Clackamas County has the primary responsibility for managing stormwater runoff from the rights of way in Oak Lodge Water Services territory outside of Gladstone's boundary. However, Oak Lodge Water Services helps the county manage some stormwater facilities and portions of each stormwater system lie within the boundaries of the other entity. As part of their efforts to develop and coordinate their utility systems, Oak Lodge Water Services predecessors and Gladstone have entered into at least six different intergovernmental agreements stemming back from the 1970s, which themselves have been amended. Some of these agreements have broadly outlined each entity's roles and responsibilities, while others have addressed the provision of utility services to specific customers. However, it has become clear to the entity's professional staff that the previous IGAs no longer adequately capture the full relationship between the two entities. For many of the previous IGAs, the language is vague, leaving staff from both entities with many questions regarding the intent of those IGAs or requiring lots of interpretation that may change over time. So staff and attorneys from each entity have been meeting periodically, like I said, for the past five years to discuss the details of a new IGA that would combine many of the provisions of the previous IGAs into one place update those provisions to match current business practices and allow the entities to coordinate their utility systems on an even stronger basis going forward. Some of the areas that we would like to highlight uh, tonight before we open it up for questions is that I, I did receive an email today from Councillor Garlington asking about, is there a map? And there are actually going to be six exhibits when we bring this back to you for final adoption. And I want to read what those exhibits will be. Exhibit one will be Oak Lodge's territorial area. Exhibit two will be Gladstone's territorial area. Exhibit three will be location of water mains that are part of each party's water system. Exhibit four will be each party's service area for water service. Exhibit five will be each party's service area for wastewater service. And exhibit six, which we feel is one of our most important, is the wastewater improvement list for Gladstone's wastewater system. And these are the projects that we will be committed to completing in the years 2024 through 2027. So for tonight, I'm going to ask Ashley or Tommy if there's any of the items that they want to go and through in the IGA, which is in the staff report in regards to how long is the lease agreement, the service areas, the rights and obligations to customers, um, and then the utility, utility system obligations. And then I think Brad is gonna show us a map of the service area for Oak Lodge Water Services. Darren is gonna show one for Gladstone and Darren's also gonna go through the proposed projects that we're going to complete uh, per this agreement. So with that, um, Ashley, I think I'll hand it over to you to see if you would like, you or Tommy wanna discuss any of the highlighted terms from the staff report. Good evening, Council. Ashley, Ashley Driscoll, City Attorney's Office. Um, this is actually the first time that I am meeting many of you. Um, so nice to uh, see all you tonight. Um, I think Jackie went over a lot of the terms of the IGA at a pretty high level. Um, so I'll just hit on a couple. Um, it is a 40-year term on the IGA, uh, which is relatively typical as we put in the staff report for an agreement of this nature that involves um, you know, complicated and expensive utility systems. And as pointed out, you know, we've been offer operating under a previous agreement that had been in place more than 50 years. However, as with all agreements of this nature, there is an escape valve. If at any time the agreement is not working, one party can provide notice to the other party. And after a 10 year waiting period or 10 year period to organize, you know, each party's affairs, um, the term of the agreement would end. And that's pretty typical regarding these types of agreements. Um, the IGA is long and it's relatively complicated. 
Um, you know, as Jackie went over, generally service is now going to follow water. So the combination of your water and wastewater um, services will be from one entity and the entity will generally be the one that provides the water to each household. There are some exceptions. This is something that we um, spent a considerable amount of time in as we are negotiating this IGA. Are there situations where the general rule um, doesn't make sense? And at this point, after looking at many different iterations, we identified four properties where it just didn't make sense for both services to follow water. We also spent a considerable amount of time on um, the city's commitment and agreement regarding inspect inspecting its utility system and agreeing to, um, to make repairs in combination or in consideration of the other commitments that the city will have. Um, I think both parties really worked together well. We had similar interests and were able to come up with what I think is you know, a very good compromise for both sides. Um, and also common, combined all the other IGAs and all the other issues that we have been dealing with throughout the years. For instance, um, you know, how Oak, or I'm sorry, how Gladstone interacts with Oak Lodge as a customer, um, that is addressed as well. And um, the rights and obligations to each one of our customers, and then issues regarding um, permits and SDCs. And specifically that, you know, some of the, some of the right-of-way fees that the city currently charges Oak Lodge water system will continue. So that's a very high level overview of what's in the agreement. I'm certainly available for questions. Um, Tommy, if you have anything to add to that, you know, please go ahead. Um, good evening. My name is Tommy Brooks with the firm Cable Houston and I work as uh, Oak Lodge's general counsel. I really don't have anything to add. I think uh, Ashley touched on exactly what I would reiterate, which is just sort of the general structure of this and trying to the extent we can get customers into having one service provider um, and having that follow water seem to make the most sense. So if you do have questions or how these things hang together, I think that fundamental piece is a good thing to keep in mind because almost everything flows out of that structure, um, whether it's how each of the services work or as Ashley mentioned, the exceptions to that. Um, so that's really the starting point and, and served as the basis for the discussion between the two parties. So. Um, I, I have one question since it just came up. Um, these, this relatively small number of exceptions to the, to the way uh, these particular properties, do they tend to be commercial properties, residential properties? Is it just because of where they're located in the system that they don't seem to work the way that the, the vast majority of the properties are going to work? Or, or is there any real generalization about there, there is a rationale behind it. I think it's more of an engineering thing. So okay. I'll let yep. Brad take that on. Brad, thank you. Good evening. Uh, the four properties are residential. And what happens with those four properties and why they don't follow the normal pattern that we've outlined in the agreement is, is the wastewater mains um, kind of flow from Oak Lodge, or excuse me, it's all Gladstone, Maine. So if we followed the uh, water service, their Oak Lodge water service is serving those. But so it would be kind of in the middle of Gladstone's wastewater main. So it's hard to follow that service and exclude those out of Gladstone's service area when it's Gladstone on either side. I see. So it's it's a it's a rare instance in this case. And uh, working with uh, Darren and uh, Gladstone, as Ashley said, we discussed this at length, you know, through this process, and we found that those four were the appropriate exceptions. So they it just happens to be where they're located in just relation located. to the pipes that are existing. Correct. Okay. Yep. All right, thank you. Yep. Uh, do other counselors have questions on what we've heard so far? <laughs> Go ahead, Councilor Alexander. I was just wondering why, this, the, the first one was in 1994, correct? The, the agreement you guys had? It's set in here? The first Maybe one goes earlier back to the 70s. 70s. Yeah. Well, I just wonder, is it never been looked at or 800 Gladstone customers, there's a lot of customers. Did you ever think about changing the district lines? So we all use West Oak Lodge and Milwaukee all use Oak Lodge. Is that something that would have been cheaper down the road or something to look at? Or I think that uh, historically over time, uh, originally there were two districts, one for sanitary and one for water, and both had agreements with Gladstone. And the reason why 
the infrastructure has grown the way it is, is based on um, uh, geography, meaning which way the wastewater flows. And so that's the difference between whether it's Wes or whether it's us, it's where the natural flow goes with the least amount of pumping. Okay, so these, these 800 homes fall in an area where it goes down to you guys. Yes. Flows down. Okay, thank you. Is that all the questions? Are we asking all our questions or just that? Well, <laughs> I, think, I think there's more staff report. I interrupted okay. with a question. I think we should continue on the, on the path that you had begun us on. No, that's fine. Darren, was there anything you wanted to add to that answer? No, that was, that was everything. Okay, good. Um, I also wanted to follow up on the other uh, questions that Councillor Garlington brought to our attention, and it had to do with Article 6.5 in Article 8.5 in regards to when will the city and Oak Lodge Water Services develop protocols that are mentioned in the draft IGA. And once both IGAs are adopted by both bo uh, bodies, then staff will get together and develop those protocols for that. Um, and I think, Brad, if you want to go ahead and show the map that you have. The third one. Number three. No, oh, not that one. That one. This map may look familiar to uh, a few folks. Uh, this is the same one that we presented, uh, kind of a getting to know each other session, you know, at the work session a few months ago. And generally, this is Oak Lodge's uh, service area. Um, in the map and really what to key in on is the area in the circle uh, you can see kind of south of the the dark uh, dark line there in the green and a little bit of the yellow that's Gladstone the city of Gladstone area and that's the area that flows to Oak Lodge uh, wastewater treatment plant um, and so we had the trunk mains um, highlighted there uh, and it's probably not showing up in this one very well uh, you can see trunk 2a and then uh, flowing all the way down to what we call ls2 and then the wastewater treatment plant which is lift station 2 or a pump station so basically the wastewater flow from gladstone flows all the way through oak lodge's service area to get to the wastewater treatment plant so we have approximately 650 wastewater customers we serve for the city of Gladstone, uh, it, and it starts at lift station six there on Glen Echo Avenue, and then uh, flows north northwest uh, to our wastewater treatment plant. <clears throat> and then we'll have Darren go ahead and go over uh, the city's map. Yeah. yeah, so this, well, it's not very good, it's hard to see, but <clears throat> so the, the area in pink is the Oak Lodge area inside of Gladstone. The orange color is the West area inside of Gladstone. So in Brad's picture there, it's it's kind of the, the same shape as what he had there. It's just a little um, more zoomed in as to where that is. So when, when people say, well, it's cheaper to have West service than Oak Lodge water service, I want them you can see the pipes aren't there to hook up to West. So it's not really a choice for the customers. This is the infrastructure that we have in place. And I think educating them to understand how far it flows to get to the wastewater treatment plant. But that's really what we wanted to illustrate is that they can't choose one or the other. These are the pipes that are in the ground. That's where the system goes. And then I think we'll go ahead and have Darren go through the list of the capital improvement projects that the city has initially agreed to. So this is a map that shows uh, there were 25 deficiencies found uh, in the system. Uh, in 2021, Oak Lodge came through and TV'd all of the Oak Lodge system to find any deficiencies or issues within the um, system. Uh, with that, they came up with a list of 25. They're on there uh, in the different colors. I know it's hard to, to read, but I'll go over that. Um, with that, 
um, there are in, uh, excuse me, we put this on a capital plan for uh, the next four years from 2024 through 2027. Uh, we'll be fixing those, a portion of those each year uh, moving forward, starting in 2024, finishing in 2027. So in 2024, there are nine repairs. Those are the, um, the ones shown in blue on the map. In 2025, there are four repairs. Uh, those are shown in green. The reason there's less is because the dollar amounts that are associated with them. We tried to keep it so that the dollar amount was pretty much equal all the way through uh, the four years, uh, with the exception of the last year, which is significantly less. Uh, 2026, there are 11 repairs. Those are shown on the map in red. And in 2027, there are two repairs. Those are shown in yellow. So once we get through all these re repairs, part of the IGA is us to go back through and then re-TV the entire Oak Lodge area of town. And then we'll come up with a new list and then we will put those on a capital improvement plan going forward to make those repairs as needed going forward. Darren, will these repairs be handled by uh, Gladstone Public Works, or is this something that would be put out to contract by someone else? Uh, these would be contracted out. Okay. And as part of our budget committee process, we have included in the 2024 capital improvement list the projects committed to the Oak uh, Lodge Water Services area, which we'll be going over next week during the budget committee. And as I also have uh, updated the council, Darren's in the process of acquiring a used C CTV truck from West that will help us immensely in identifying issues in our infrastructure. And also it will help us be able to maintain the wastewater system inspection that we're gonna be required to do. Do other councilors have questions? Councilor Huckabee? Thank you. Is there a reason why the repairs are condensed to such a small area of Gladstone? It's pretty much from Jersey, from what I can see, to Caldwell. Right. So uh, in the map I showed you previous, that pink area, majority of the system is right in this area. And that's where all the deficiencies were. It does go up above Oakfield a little bit, mm -hmm. but there were no deficiencies found in that area. Okay. My, my guess, I don't know, is the area above Oakfield is a newer system than what we have lower. Okay, thank you. And these are fours and fives. Yeah, so when you uh, do TV inspections, everything gets a rating from a, a zero, which is perfect condition, to a five, which is not very good, actually the worst it could be. And every dot that you see on there were anything with a condition of four and five on there. Well, so that, that makes me ask then, um, you've obviously, you've divided them up by year and, and grouped them in a way that gets you approximately similar costs, which helps in, in budgeting and funding. Um, have you identified some as more priority, higher priority in terms of their impact on the rest of the system? And are those being handled first? Yeah, so we're, we're taking anything that was a five and doing that right out the gate. Okay. So in year one of that would be the most, uh, the ones that need the most uh, repair work done on them. And then there may be a couple in year two of that. And then everything after that is pretty much fours after that. Okay. So it was not strictly just a division uh, by cost, but it was also oriented based on uh, uh, severity. Yes, that okay. is correct. Thank you. Yes, Councilor Garlington. I can't remember if you said, are these um, in-house fixes or are you buying out? Those will have to be contracted out. All of the dots. All of the dots will have to be contracted out, yes. Okay, thank you. And keep in mind that another item on your agenda tonight is to talk about the other part of Gladstone of where our focus on the infrastructure is. Oak Lodge has been so patient with Gladstone because we have a memo of understanding in place with DEQ. Our priority is the West area and dealing with our infill inflow and infiltration, which like I said, we're going to learn about later. But these are repairs that we are confident 
uh, with the current rates that we're receiving that we will be able to commit the city to in 2024 through 2027. So we're actually able to start fixing the entirety of the infrastructure, both in Oak Lodge and West areas. And one more question about uh, who's going to pay for it. Does the intergovernmental agreement uh, include uh, a, a sharing obligation as far as the cost of these repairs, or is it strictly the city because it's within the city limits? So all of these pipes that we're talking about are owned by the city of Gladstone. It is Gladstone's responsibility to repair these pipes. Okay. Councilor Roberts, you had a... Sort of a follow-up to your last point, Administrator Betts. Um, I hate to ask about the friend that's not at the party, but do we have a similar outlay of repairs needed on Wes's west side of the opposite of this map, essentially? Do yeah. we have the same... It's agenda item number three okay. tonight. That's yes. There. Thank you. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, now, was there more to this that you wanted to share with us tonight? This is just preparation for an agreement which should be finalized and expanded upon, in terms of including the exhibits uh, and brought to us later for uh, for our action. That's correct. It will come before you, July 11th, and it will go to the Oak Lodge Water Services Board on July 18th for final adoption. All right. Any other input, anything that we've left out that you feel we should know before we go away from tonight? Sarah Jo? I just wanted to say that uh, I believe that our teams have grown closer together with all of the conversations we've had as we've waded our way through the variety of older IGAs and uh, very glad uh, that we have reached uh, this spot and have enjoyed working uh, together to get here. Well, I'm sure that consolidation of all these years of work into one document that, you know, that, that is less vague and more thorough and more up to date will be an improvement for us. So I look forward to seeing that and uh, for hopefully for us to, uh, you know, decide that we want to adopt it. So thank you so much for coming and sharing tonight. Councilor Alexander has one more question. Yeah, I had it written. Just so you could explain 9.1. Point five two on page 114. I was getting confused by that with the inner tie. So where our pipes meet Oak Lodge's pipes, are you guys charging us an extra five cents or 50 cents? I, I, I got confused on how that works reading it. And I read it a few times, 50% of Oak Lodge's then current base charge applicable to the meter size at each inner tie. And so I was just trying to understand who's charging who, or if you guys change, we change or, our customers pay more. I didn't know how that worked. Um, so I believe that uh, uh, this is uh, related to our interties during emergencies. I think your is your mic on. I thought it was. There. I think this is related to our uh, intertie uh, exchanges during emergencies. Uh, if if you need to tap into our water, we we have. Uh, a different route where Gladstone can get more water. But in the original IGA, it wasn't clear what the charge should be. And it's only very rarely that you've had to use it. But during emergencies, it's wonderful to have that connection. And, and the other paragraph represents, uh, represents going the other direction too. If you have an emergency and you need our water to provide for your customers, yes, there's, there's some agreement there. Yes. Okay. And the finance people wanted to make sure that the charges were clear and it wasn't in the previous IGA. Okay. So we're doing, we're doing an IGA. Uh, we're doing the IGA, but right here it says, Oak Lodge will notify Gladstone of the rate proposed by the budget committee. Did you already notify us? Is that, I mean, is, or are you still, because it says of the final rate proposed uh, a board upon adoption of that rate. Is that uh, rate been adopted? So, um, so every year, when we go through our budget process, much like you go through your budget process to set rates, as soon as we have information, we share it with uh, your city administrator and the rest of her team. We are still in our budget process right now, but uh, we had wanted to set up uh, the outline for what information gets exchanged when as part of helping it be really clear how our teams could best work together. 
in July of each year, we bring an updated master fee schedule to the city council that includes WES increases and Oak Lodge water services increases. So that will be coming before you July 11th. And you just have a board that does your stuff, right? There's, it's not a it, city thing or a boat, or it's just a board. It's a it's, large it, water. It's um, very similar to a city council in that it's elected by all of the board. Five board members are elected by all of the customers, and they serve uh, staggered terms and uh, run their meetings in a very similar way uh, as a district um, to make decisions. We have to go through the same public. Uh, budget process. We have our own uh, budget committee uh, and uh, decisions are made regarding the rates. Well, we do, and we don't really have another option, do we? I mean, isn't that just pointing it out, right? I mean, we have, we have to use you guys, right? Yeah, there is a significant investment uh, for each of your utility providers in the pipes and the infrastructure to process and uh, uh, it takes quite an investment. Uh, I think the idea of trying to build a new uh, wastewater treatment plant from scratch right now, uh, most um, cities and districts would not contemplate. Okay, thank you. One thing. All right, Councillor Garlington. I just want everyone to note on here that this is a 40 year agreement and somehow our names may be mentioned in 40 years <laughs> <laughs> that we were the originators of this agreement. So thank you for all your time and all your trouble. We appreciate it. I had one further question on the same point that Council Alexander brought up, uh, 9152. Um, how were those rates realized? The five cents and 15 cents. Does that cover an associated cost? Is that consistent cost to travel both ways or to reflect the um, 10 cent difference? Is it more costly to travel one way? Um, I don't know if it's more costly to travel one way or the other, but since this is used for during emergencies, uh, uh, the sense was that the formula needed to be easy uh, to uh, charge either side and that really uh, we didn't want um, our partner to hesitate uh, or us to hesitate to call to say we need help. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the, the charge is to recover costs, but it wasn't to the absolute penny because it's for during emergencies. Thank you very much. I think it's a little bit analogous to the mutual aid that we have with our uh, uh, public safety people too. Uh, sometimes we get more help from Clackamas Sheriff than we provide, than our police department or provides to them. And sometimes when we had a separate fire department, you know, we helped a little more and they, they helped, but it all balances out. And just having the, the, the security of knowing that you have a partner with which you could, or have a cooperative agreement in place is the, the most important thing. And uh, the cost is probably secondary to that. Uh, it's just having it laid out. So I'm glad that you thought to include this uh, for those circumstances and that that will be part of what we look at in the future. Thank you all for coming and uh, for serving so many of our residents uh, by your services. And uh, this is budget season for everybody. So good luck getting back to that. Uh, I just had budget hearings for, for Wes earlier this week because I'm on their board. So. Everybody's doing it. Everybody's engaged with it. It's never easy, but uh, it's, uh, it's a process we all do. And, and thank you for being a part of it, that too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we will shift gears to a whole new area. Jackie, would you like to introduce the next item? I would like to introduce our community services manager, Tiffany Kirkpatrick, who has a very exciting topic for our advisory board to share with you tonight. Hello, glad to be here tonight, finally, for our work session on changing the name of the Gladstone Senior Center. And I'd like to um, have everyone that's on our, our board come up to the table right in front of you. And Mindy, our president will lead us 
as we sort of go through very shortly our process and how we ended up with the result that we did and how we all unanimously voted for the same name so that we could discuss that tonight with city council. And also, I think it would be nice. Uh, Roxanne mentioned that she is the most senior, uh, and she's she's right. The most senior, not not with age, <laughs> but just that she has seen this process get started, go back and forth. And I just thought she might want to highlight kind of what what they have been through. And this is before me just to sort of preface the conversation. Yes. Yeah, if, if you push the button, it will it will turn on and stay on, so you don't have to hold it. So okay. go yes. ahead, Roxanne. Thank you for hearing us out tonight. Um, about four years ago, I was approached by a friend five years ago to join the advisory board. And I thought, well, I'm volunteering at kindergarten Maybe this would be a lateral move. <laughs> um, at that time, the management of the of the center was discussing how to increase the participation of our seniors because there wasn't a whole lot of interest in outside activities. Um, the board began to discuss changes that were being made in other communities, Milwaukee, Oregon City, West Lynn, Canby, how the senior centers had a uh, sort of a reputation of taking care of old people only. And uh, maybe that wasn't what the communities really would benefit from. And uh, then COVID hit. So that all kind of went away. Um, new management has uh, been installed. Some new board members have been added, uh, but the, the energy is still there to make change and to expand the center as an asset to the entire community. Uh, that's sort of why we're here talking about changing the name. Um, the senior center has sort of a designation. Um, I think that Gladstone has seen a, a lot of new families, a lot of uh, growth in the family mentality here. And we do have, um, I've been here for 45 years. I've known a lot of people in the city management. Um, my husband and I were in the JCs. We have, uh, adult children who graduated down the street. And now I have granddaughters in the system who's learning to drive. <laughs> <laughs> but I think Gladstone would benefit very much from having an asset uh, that is accessible for private uh, events, for more of uh, inclusion in the community groups like Rotary, Kiwanis. And I think we've seen the new management bring that energy. So we're here today to talk about making uh, the first step in making it popular throughout our community. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Roxanne. Uh, thank you so much um, for allowing us to be here today. Um, if you will allow me, I'm going to read through the handout um, that I gave each of you. And what this is, is um, it's really about the outreach, the community outreach that we did and the results of that outreach that led to uh, a name being <laughs> selected and presented to you today. Um, the board voted, the senior uh, center board voted unanimously for the renaming of the Gladstone Senior Center to be the Gladstone Community Center, the spirit of generations. We feel this incorporates the new mission and vision for the center, which is to enhance the vitality and wellness of a multi-generational community through meaningful connections. 
We did write a new mission and vision statement for the center. The mission is to enhance the vitality and wellness of a multi-generational community through meaningful connections. Our vision is to provide an enriching space for community connections, encourage and provide space for group activities, meals, recreational classes, share information about health and wellness, as well as other social gatherings that occur within a community. Survey number one conducted from March 6th through March 20th asked the community for name suggestions for renaming the center. Outreach included a poster board at the center, posts on social media, the Gladstone newsletter, and an online survey. We had a combination of handwritten and online submissions. Total respondents equaled 96 with 31 online and 65 handwritten, 26 of those from bingo night on <laughs> March 17th. When tallied, most entries were a standalone, meaning a name was suggested only one time. Some names had a total of two or three entries. The largest group was for the suggested name of the Gladstone Community Center with 23 entries, including eight online and 15 handwritten. The Gladstone Senior Center Advisory Board discussed the results at their board meeting on March 21st. The board voted to move forward with five possible names for the next phase of community outreach. Those names were the Gladstone Community Center, the Center of Gladstone, the Gathering Place, the Gladstone Enrichment Center, and the Chautauqua Community Center. Survey number two, conducted from March 21st through April 6th, asked the community to vote between those five possible names. Again, outreach included a poster board at the center, posts on social media, the Gladstone newsletter, and an online survey. We had a combination of handwritten and online submissions for this survey as well. Total respondents equaled 84, with 55 online and 29 handwritten. When tallied, the name selected most was the Gladstone Community Center with 57% of the votes. This included 33 online and 15 handwritten votes. Many of the suggested names from survey number one really resonated with the Gladstone Senior Center Advisory Board. While the names were not necessarily top choices for an official renaming, it is the opinion of the board that an addition to the official name would only enhance the overall inclusivity we are trying to convey to the community. At the Gladstone Senior Center Advisory Board meeting on April 22nd, the board was presented with the following choices. In addition to the official name of the Gladstone Community Center, the tags of a place for everyone, the heart of Happy Rock, a gathering place, the spirit of generations, and multi-generational connections was voted on. The Gladstone Community Center, the spirit of generations, was voted on unanimously by the board. We now ask for the Gladstone City Council to approve our request. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much. I appreciate your sharing that process and you're honoring the wishes of the people who took the time to vote and, and yet uh, trying to enhance that with something which really reflected your vision. So uh, it looks like you managed to uh, find a way to accomplish both goals and have come up with a, a recommendation for us based on that effort. Um, uh, are there any questions from counselors about uh, the process or the, the result or the recommendation? Councilor Garlington. Um, the Gladstone Community Center across from, is that what it's called? Across from Wetton. What what's their plan? No, that's a community it's, that's club. A community, yeah, community it, club? Yes, yeah. it's it has technically called, it's yeah. not called the Gladstone Community Center. Well, I know technically, but if you look on a map and you type that in, that's mm -hmm. exactly what comes up. Mm -hmm. So have they? <laughs> I can have, just, I can comment on that. Okay. Um, but it's hearsay, and it was when I first started. I remember us talking about this a little bit, um, just about changing the name. And I remember us talking about the Gladstone Community Center, like what would we do if we wanted that name? What about the club down the street? And I don't know who it was, but they said whoever owns that, I'm sure somebody here knows, that they would be willing to, um, they, they're not wedded to that name themselves. Now, I don't know if that's an issue or if that, um, you know, is true or whatever, but it was within the meeting that, that I heard that. 
um, information that they would be willing to give up that name. I think if we I, I think it would be so. I don't know. Just a simple thing to reach out and mm -hmm. ask. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not against this at all. I think it's a really good idea. I love where the senior center is going, or the Gladstone Community Center is going. I love what's happening there. I just think it would, you know, as a quick reach out would be a good idea. I agree, and I've always thought that that would be a great place for a historical society building or affordable housing on the property that's there. It is owned by a nonprofit. So I do think mm -hmm. Tiffany could reach out and, and contact. It is the Gladstone Community Club, mm -hmm. but there would be um, some conflicting interest there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I think that I, I would like that. Okay. I'd like to see that. I'm just excited to hear more about the changing focus of the senior center as it becomes this new intergenerational focus. Um, and actually, maybe Administrator Betts might know more about when we might hear more about that, about the vision of the center and what changes might be coming up, you know, alongside this name change. Yeah, I think this was the first step. And in, in, is this something the city council wants to go ahead and do? And if you all give me head nods tonight, we will prepare a resolution to bring back to you in July to officially rename it. And then I think it's it's really about setting a pace for the advisory board where they can thoughtfully look at their membership and then talk about what that expanded vision will be. And, and maybe Tiffany would like to touch on that a bit too. Um, well, it's, you know, in our goals to address, and I think I like what Jackie said about waiting until July, because this is the first step. And, um, you know, I feel that we have been a community center all along. I think that it is more of, um, changing the name to make this official, but we have been doing the work and making the impact already. So I don't see some overnight, you know, sudden we we're doing it. And we just want to um, move along with all the other senior centers in the community and outside of Oregon, even that are called community centers or coming up with some other name. There's some great names out there. Um, and we're doing positive aging programs. We are inclusive of all ages. Um, our services reach outside of people that are under 60 uh, when it comes to nutrition and um our guest services. So I'm, I'm just really, I feel that we're just changing the name at this point, but we're going to keep moving along with our goals, um, which you'll see, um, you know, you'll see in writing in July as we update you. But I mean, there's lots of ideas bubbling over so that that will come. Awesome. Great it's question. Exciting. Yeah. It's a great question. I'm glad you're excited. Thank you. As you, as you put the word out to seek uh, ideas for a new name uh, and with sort of the implication that maybe the word senior would no longer be part of the name, was there, did you come across people who were concerned that maybe that the center would be less involved with people who are traditionally thought of as seniors? I'm, he, I'm seeing some heads nod. I, I want to hear if you heard that and, and how you responded to it. Um, what we did is we, we very much thought about how people were going to respond to us wanting to change the name of the senior center. And what we did is we did a very thoughtful uh, Q&A. And so all of the outreach material, the poster boards, the social media, everything that we did for the community outreach included these questions and answers. And what this did is, is it asked questions like, are my senior programs going away? Um, what is changing for me as a senior using this community center? And we said, nothing is changing for you. You are the heart of this center. Mm -hmm. If anything, we want to provide more. We want more activities for you. We want more meals for homebound seniors. And how do we do that? We need to generate revenue. We need to rent out some space on the weekends and we need to get more community involvement. We need more volunteers. And so we use this uh, Q&A to really uh, alleviate some of the um, apprehension um, some of the anxiety that some of our community were feeling 
about uh, having the the name, you know, the 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 word senior taken out by trying to tell them that we're you are our focus still. And I think it I think it worked. <laughs> Thank you. I, I appreciate your sharing that. Tiffany, did you want to add to that? Is that no, the... that was great. Thanks for remembering. I wish we had brought that document. Um, but the QA was really um impactful. It really does take care of a lot of questions that people have. And we were uh, we had anxiety about um about that also. And um I, I really tried to share some research also around, I mean, it's been researched very, very much about um, this next generation, which when you're within a generation, you don't really care about the one before you or after. <laughs> um, but I just tried to use that to give some background as to the fact that people don't and won't always identify as a senior and that their generation does and that's okay but we have to think about this being their legacy that you know so they have ownership of the center but if they think about it you know they are um if they're changing the future and so they're the legacy of the center right now so we need to think forward and so i shared research um articles about the fact that some people just won't identify. So we wanna be inclusive and we want to see them here and we want them to feel comfortable. So we have to move in that direction without taking away the senior services, we can just um, enhance what we're doing. And I, I think it's working and um, that fear just goes away after a while. People get used to things that they were afraid of. That's just a general, that's what they do. They complain, they go through a process. It's, you know, like grieving, you go through a process. And so, um, I just think we have to be mindful about, um, maintaining the same level of service. Um, and also, you know, painting the center, you know, showing that the, the kids group that comes through for the day is helping with the garden. Um, just showing the enhancements of the program without, um, you know, taking away from what we're offering to seniors, which we cannot do. I mean, that's, that's the work that we do and are expected to do by the county. I use that angle as well. It's not going away. It's just going to get better. So, yeah. All right. Uh, Councillor Huckabee. Thank you. I just wanted to thank you all um, for your efforts and time you guys have put into this process. And a big thank you to Mindy for handling a lot of the administrative mm -hmm. and creative side in the outreach and the pamphlet was wonderful. So thank you yes. all. Thank you so much. <laughs> so I, the only question I have, just so now that we're calling it the Gladstone Community Center and you're not gonna take anything away from the seniors and all, you're gonna keep everything, but um, just, just, out, just thinking, so a group of high school kids, four or five wanna get together and do homework. They can come over there and use a room i mean it's a community center now is it open to everybody yes. in the community or not yes it is okay that's all i want to know because i had my neighbor say yeah when they when they change that then we can go over and do our homework and, and they, study classes yes. and i was like okay so i just wanted to double check yeah and they and they could have before too. Oh, okay. i they think that's what we're trying to do okay. i mean yes this right. includes educating the public too on what it means to be a community center so there's work to do there um, you know, it'll, it'll be the same <laughs> as far as, uh, you know, if somebody's not, uh, if the, someone's a minor, they will always have to come in with an adult or a group. Uh, that's just what it is. Um, but it's always been that way. In fact, that happens now without the name change, but this will be like an education and we need everyone to help educate people. And so hopefully, you know, I've been working with Jennifer at the community school to also incorporate some new offerings. We'd like to see more than um, classes that are just for um, 60 plus happen there because the 60 plus want to see those classes too, like line dancing. We're going to do line dancing soon. Um, and that's new. Just some other, other offerings so that people can be exposed to the space and claim it. As their, Although, as their own. I will say I do not identify as a senior, but I did sign up for gentle yoga <laughs> starting in June. So very excited. <laughs> um, I think you're right. I think like those, the Gladstone community school, those class yeah. offerings are incredible value. Yeah, it's, it is. it's an incredible value that you guys are offering the community. Um, 
and I'm just excited for the future. And join me at Gentle Yoga. There's still spots open on Thursdays. <laughs> yeah, no, it's great. <coughs> yep. Thank you. All right. Well, I we're grateful to you all for coming and sharing and the work you put into this. And we look forward to hearing from you again soon. Thanks very much. I've got right here. All right, and we're ready for item number three. All right, back to infrastructure. Our Senior Center Advisory Board is welcome to stay if they would like to learn more about our sewer and water. Um, but actually, you got the right people here tonight that are very excited because we've been working so hard to try to address our deficiencies. And so I'm going to have uh, Darren introduce our guest tonight for another thoughtful presentation. So tonight we have uh, Rob Lee from Leeway Engineering. Uh, he's going to go over uh, I and I, what it is. And then um, we'll take questions on the INI project that we're currently in the process of uh, doing design on. Uh, we're hoping to be able to bring a contract back to you all uh, in July is what we're shooting for. Um, but we're just not 100% done with all of the design work. So it may end up having to get pushed out to August, but we're still shooting for the July council meeting to take a contract back to you. So Rob. All right. Good to see everyone. Uh, Darren, how much time would you, I can go as slow or as fast as you want. I know it's 6.30 on a, <laughs> on a Tuesday. You go at your pace and if they have questions, I'm sure they'll ask. Okay. Sounds great. Well, I think I recognize maybe Councillor Alexander as the only face. I don't remember everyone. The last time I was here was a Zoom meeting a, over a year ago. So I know a lot of new faces here. Um, there's a presentation. I'm not sure if how to go about bringing that up. And we did make copies of everybody for the PowerPoint afterwards as well. All right. Great. And I think I have some controls here. So a little bit of background. I'm going to cover INI, inflow and infiltration, what it is, and then talk about how that specifically impacts the city of Gladstone. Um, a lot of words. Uh, folks may have heard of inflow and infiltration. Uh, there's a differentiation between the two. Infiltration is basically how clean groundwater gets into our sanitary sewers. Um, they are not intended it's not intended to leak and allow this groundwater to get in. It gets in through a variety of ways, through the public mains, the, the sewers themselves, the manholes and the pipes having defects and uh, allowing that clean water to get in. Um, but it also comes from private side sources, the laterals, the sewer lines that are coming out of someone's home uh, or even um, through their foundation and some of those well, ways that they might have some connections they don't even know about, but are allowing groundwater to get in and flow into the sanitary sewers. All of that kind of to the first uh, work agenda item uh, gets to either the West system or the Oak Lodge system. It has to either be pumped or treated. All of that just adds cost. Then there's inflow. Inflow is water that should be conveyed through our storm sewer system. It's it just uh, rainfall when it rains, and it's this high volume of water that gets in and actually overwhelms our sewer systems. Um, uh, the big culprit is catch basins, uh, catch basins or roof drains. So these places where you have a big impervious area and that water is supposed to be collected and then conveyed to our creeks, to our rivers, instead are making their way into our sanitary system. So you can just envision um, our, our small pipes, which are intended for wastewater, are getting overwhelmed during our rainy seasons. And that's what's been happening in Gladstone. But it's not just Gladstone, it's a regional issue. This is an excerpt from the, the West uh, Master Plan, their, their collection system master plan. And what they've highlighted here in red are all of the areas in the West service area that are impacted by high INI to the point where they're saying we need to address INI in all of these areas as it's more cost effective than just opening everything up 
building bigger pipes, building bigger pump stations, building bigger treatment. So you can see Gladstone right there in the center, uh, the, the area being contributed to, uh, to the West system is highlighted there in red with the Gladstone pump station um, uh, there in blue. That's where all of the Gladstone system flows into and then gets pumped over to the West system. So when we talk about balanced investments, this is what the Clackamas West master plan was, I, I believe, aiming toward is what's the most cost effective for the region. Um, we can try to do everything to seal up all the pipes in the entire region, and, and that will come at a certain cost. It's actually pretty expensive to do that. And the flip side is to open everything up, as I mentioned, uh, pump it, treat it. We are seeing treatment costs get more and more expensive um, as we go along. There's increased regulatory scrutiny. Uh, people may or may not have heard the term PFOS recently. Um, we're expecting that hasn't quite hit our treatment standards yet, but we're expecting um, that to hit our treatment standards. And every time these new things are found and we've got to treat and try to remove it from our wastewater, treatment just gets that much more expensive. So ideally, we can find a location like this graph shows of where is the lowest cost for the region. And that's what West tried to do in their, in their planning documents. So how does this impact Gladstone? Um, there are the, these are the two uh, basins where, that were identified in the West master plan that uh, are contributing to the West uh, collection system and treatment system. Um, we've got our Western basin, which has that number uh, 10100, and the Eastern side, which is the 20400. Uh, you can see some statistics about it. Ultimately, it's around 60,000 linear feet of pipeline. So, uh, almost 12 miles of pipe if we were to lay it all out. And that's just what Gladstone owns in terms of the sewer mains. Uh, you also have close to 1600 laterals or connections. So all of the private homes. So there's a lot of homes connected to these, to these areas. And all of those, uh, an aging system that does allow a good amount of I&I. &I. I'll show some... Some doc or some slides that talk about how bad is it? Is this really something that Gladstone needs to address? So one of the ways we do it is we uh, <clears throat> look at flow monitoring data. So how does the system respond to like a storm event? And this is a storm event that happened in June of 2019. Um, a lot of Junes, uh, we don't have groundwater is typically uh, decreasing at that point. Occasionally we'll get a, a, a flashy storm and that's what you see here. Uh, the bars from the top in gray, that's like rainfall. And it just shows, okay, we had a couple spikes of rain, but it wasn't like this big, long, multiple day rain event. And the blue line ultimately just shows how the system, Gladstone system here in the West Basin responded. The, the flows in the uh, going to the Gladstone pump station peaked by a factor of eight. Um, most of the time we design our systems to peak out and, and handle no greater than four. So a peaking factor of eight is pretty extreme. Um, that's from a flashy storm where we expect groundwater to be a little lower than during our wet season. Here's a, an instance in, in April of that same 2019 year. And uh, again, the blue lines just show the system response to wet weather. This was like a long duration, kind of typical spring wet weather event that we get. This was a peaking factor of 12 and a half. Um, and, uh, and that stayed high for quite a while. So you can just envision all of that water that has to get conveyed, pumped, treated. So that's the West Basin. East Basin's not as bad, um, but it still does respond quite a bit to wet weather. So that same June 26 storm, we had a peaking factor of two. And then in April, that peaking factor got up to that 5.5. So it's not nearly as bad as the West Basin, but still greater than what we would expect. Both of these storms are more of a... Uh, uh, a regular recurring storm. Oregon, uh, as the Env Department of Environmental Quality, uh, they, they regulate around what we call a five-year storm frequency. So when that storm happens, uh, that only comes once on average every five years. That's what they say. Keep it all in your pipes. Don't let anything overflow uh, or get into our water bodies. Anything greater than that, there's a level of reasonableness that we just don't expect a city to have to like keep and contain. 
Um, so the, the issue with Gladstone is that during these types of events, we were seeing overflows at the Gladstone pump station. So much more frequent than the one in five year. <clears throat> So uh, we were retained, uh, my firm was retained back in 2020 um, to help do some investigation. And we did what we call smoke testing. It's basically blowing vapor into the sanitary sewers and looking for where that vapor is emitting. We're basically, we're looking for leaks, cross connections, that kind of thing. Uh, all the dots here show where we saw emissions. Um, and, and the smoke testing firm that did this work was pretty astounded. They're like, we go, we're called when things are bad. Um, this was really bad. It was around three times more emissions than we normally see when we're called in to do a project. Um, so of that 70,000 linear feet, 239 incidences or emissions uh, that were found. So basically what this is showing is a lot of pathways for clean water to get into the sanitary system. Uh, I'm not going to go through uh, the pictures, and uh, this is the only slide I have for it. We've got blow-ups of these pictures if people want me to zoom in, but you can see the smoke. It is, it's is—it's white uh, water vapor, uh, but that just coming out of the ground, coming out of catch basins, out of parking lot drains, out of roof drains. So picture to the top right, it just shows whenever it rains, all that water that's being collected from that roof gets right directly into the sanitary system. Um, so these are the types of things that we found. I'm gonna pause for one sec, give folks, these are more probably the more exciting things to look at, so. <clears throat> uh, as part of that project, we also investigated the sewer condition. So what Darren was talking about with the CCTV, uh, that's awesome, by the way, that the city is getting their own truck is just part of you know maintaining a good sewer system so we cleaned and inspected the pipes within these two basins the west and east basin 79 uh, of the inspection inspected pipes had what we had already talked about grade four or five defects those are rate defects are just rated as your pipe is reaching the end of its useful life you need to address this before it gets worse or uh, possibly collapse and create like an overflow situation. Um, these are some just images of the things we were seeing, water shooting in through a manhole, cracks that indicate that the pipe no longer has a structural uh, capacity to, to handle what it was meant to handle. Uh, lots of roots, tree roots that have broken in. We did a lot of these inspections in the fall, so not during the, the rainy season, we do that on purpose because during the rainy season, the pipes are too full to actually see anything. But when we see a lot of tree roots, we just know that in the wet season, a lot of water is getting in. Um, here are some more pictures of the condition of, of the sewers. Now, keep in mind, these are the grade four and five defects. We found 79 uh, pipes with grade four or five defects around a third of the pipe. So not the entire system doesn't look like this, but these, these are fairly representative of around a third of the pipes within the West and East basins. So not great. Um, it wouldn't be what I would want for my home sewer lateral, just because if that collapses, um, now I'm in trouble when my kids decide to take their 15 minute showers that they do. So, so these are just some of the defects that we were seeing. So the, the system in the West and East Basin is uh, aging, deteriorating, uh, probably um, a lot of it has reached past its useful life. Uh, just graphically, this is what we're looking at here. The West Basin, the red indicates those grade four or five pipes. Uh, yellow indicates more of that uh, grades two or three, and then uh, green would indicate like a grade one um, where we don't recommend any work being done. Uh, here's the East Basin, another zoom up. So you can see there's quite a bit of work that needs to be done within this system just to make sure it, it can uh, handle what it was meant to handle from a structural standpoint. I would say that even if a pipe looks really good, it still can leak. And that's the problem with I and I. Um, so this, we, these are, would be to address some of the worst problems, but the pipes still need to have potentially some work done to help make sure it doesn't leak. 
So the reduction plan, how do we get rid of the INI? Well, why should we? Uh, folks here may know that uh, the city of Gladstone has entered into a, what the Oregon Department of Environmental Quality calls a mutual agreement and order. It's the state version of an EPA consent decree. It's pretty much the highest level of regulatory enforcement before it moves to the federal level. Um, and, and DEQ is pretty good about having reasonableness in that plan, but part of that plan is to do this, identify and develop a plan on how the city is gonna reduce their INI. And then the second piece is start addressing some of the findings at a certain timeline. So the recommended projects coming out of this investigation work that we did is first disconnect those inflow sources. The places we saw the, the white vapor, the smoke come out, that's where you get the most volume of water in the shortest amount of time. And typically those could be the, the quickest and most cost-effective fixes. So we recommend doing that first, then pause. Let's see how well we did. Let's see the impact to the pumps, the downstream pump station. Let's see how close we got to meeting the, the flow triggers that Wes wanted the city to get to, and then potentially move into holistic rehab of the West Basin and then the East Basin. Uh, the holistic rehab means trying to seal up the pipes in those basins, and it comes at a pretty expensive cost. Uh, here is the projects as uh, it's outlined uh, for the West Basin. Uh, basically, what we have is a lot of uh, locations where we've got these inflow sources, the roof drains, the catch basins, and they've got nowhere to go. There's no storm sewers in the area. Uh, sometimes uh, in the street, those catch basins are at the low point, and we, other than pumping, we can't figure out a way to get water to flow uphill. And so uh, the red lines are actually indicating where we are recommending extending pipes, uh, stormwater pipes, so that we can then take all that stormwater that should be flowing into these stormwater pipes and eventually get out to, to the creeks and the rivers um, and out of our sanitary system. And then the blue dots are actually locations of private inflow sources. So places where private property have these locations where <laughs> inflow, clean water is getting right in. Yeah, I just want to ask a quick question. Yeah. So um, as you're talking about prioritization of those projects, you listed um, disconnecting inflow sources, holistic rehab of West Basin, and then East Basin. Mm -hmm. Intuitively, because I don't know anything about this, I would assume that you'd go after the highest priority or the worst degraded instances as they come up. What's the thought process behind dealing with one basin at a time instead of instances at a time? Yeah, that's a great question. Um I think the best way to put it is when I first got my career started uh, 25 years ago, uh, we were, I, I was coming into the industry and my my supervisor had started doing I and I work back in the 80s. Um, that's when we used to put a camera on a skateboard and kind of push it down. I mean, we've come a long way. Uh, but he used to say how they would do that. They'd find a place where the pipe was leaking and they'd go and they'd fix it. They feel really good about it. And then they push that skateboard back through and they're like, okay, the place we fix isn't leaking, but now the locations upstream and downstream of that pipe are now leaking. Um, basically, water was finding the path of least resistance. They fixed it, and then it just started coming. And it's like the little Dutch boy at the dike, right? Putting his fingers through the holes. So then he said they started to address the full length of the pipe. That said, great, that worked, except now the next pipe upstream and downstream that weren't leaking were now leaking. Um, and then they started doing more of like, hey, let's take care of all of the pipes on the street or in this basin. And they started seeing the laterals start leaking, the places where the private homes were connected. Water basically just finds its way in. And uh, through the years of doing this, the industry has found we need to, to cost effectively remove INI, we've got to do by basin. Um, if we just do fixes here and there, we won't see any real significant reductions in INI I during those peak wet weather events. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, counselor. I just was thinking, so some of these you said are, are individual homes, private homes. Mm -hmm. Is that so, and, and well, and they take care of that themselves or is that, I mean, how's that work? 
Yeah. Um, <laughs> so for this project, and Darren, please jump in if I misspeak here, the city, because they're under this mutual agreement and order, and because it's the most cost-effective ways to remove these private sources, like the roof drains, the driveway slotted drains, uh, the city, I believe, is going to be paying for this first project uh, to remove those inflow sources. Um, I don't, I believe it's considered a pilot project. So the city's making this cost investment uh, to satisfy the mutual agreement and order. Folks like the city of Portland, for example, they have this roof drain disconnection program um, where they uh, offer someone, if they fix something on their own, a reimbursement of like 50 or $70 or something like that. Gladstone, I don't believe at this point has a program like that in place. Um, but for this first project, it's this, a city funded project. Okay, thank you. Does the city want to weigh in on, on the accuracy of that? I just want to... Yeah, I believe it was the April 2022 meeting when we talked about utilization of ARPA funds towards this project, which we will get into the financing with you when we bring the contract back for approval. But the city has committed $1.5 million of ARPA funds to this initial project and agreed to take care of the private property owners ones as well, because we wanted to use that money that would benefit the entire system. And so when we bring the contract to you for approval, you will see that was the commitment that the prior council had already made for that. Okay, that's helpful. Um, all right, go ahead. I'm gonna ask you really quick, can we just go back a couple of, I just wanna clarify a couple of things. The, the Your slide, microphone. microphone. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> the slide that is before the pipes. Uh, go back and one more, one more there. So if I remember correctly, the SDA camp is taking care of their own or how, and then this other large purple on the cluster, the cluster on 82nd drive. And we were, I, I, no, we got answers about it when we first talked about it, but how about we rehash that just a little bit? Yeah, so uh, the SDA property had over 100 um, smokes, I guess is probably the best way to put that on their property. We will work with SDA for them to fix their property. We th They are not part of of this INI program that we're working on currently. They are completely separate from that. We'll work right. with them completely separate. and. They they will be responsible for re, re, repairing their own uh, infrastructure there. Okay, and then if you go forward to to the broken pipes, what is the size of that pipe? Act real truly. I mean, I know this is a picture, but is it? Yeah, that's actually pretty good. It's around an eight inch diameter pipe. Oh, okay. Um, so, and they're all the same size. In this area, all until we get to the very lower part of the uh, west basin are all eight inch. Uh, they get, I think we get up to 10 inch and then down Portland Ave, we've got some larger pipes there as well. Um, probably oversized pipes. Cause it used to be, I believe storm sewer pipe that they converted, the city converted into sanitary sewer pipes. Okay. And then if you come forward, just, a, um, sorry, we'll have to walk through. Yeah. Um, where is, nope, come forward right here. Mm -hmm. So up on the top of the nature park, there's a red line. I would have thought something like that would have been taken care of with the build of that, uh, of Webster Ridge, no? No, that's, I believe that's actually on Quezon is where that is. Oh, it is? Okay, thank you. Okay, I'm going to keep going. Can I just uh, ask you one more question? Yeah. You yeah, mentioned yeah, DEQ. Yes. Do they oversee this? Do you have to report to them? Do they... Do we get fines? What 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 does DEQ have to? Where does it play a part? Well, so DEQ has been given authorization at the state level to enforce the Clean Water Act. So EPA gives every state the uh, the administrative power to enforce the Clean Water Act. The EPA is still the overall governing body of it. Um, DEQ, as part of that responsibility, that's where the city entered into this mutual agreement and order. Uh, in essence. The big reason why would be the pump station right down uh, at the bottom, uh, that little gold symbol um, right near the river there. Um, where, um, uh, yeah, I get to use my laser pointer, but hopefully not pointing in anyone's eyes. 
Yep. Oh, yeah. Yep. So that pump station used to overflow with regular frequency every year. Um, I think this year, Darren, if I remember right, we didn't have any overflows there. No, we haven't had any overflows. And ever since we did the West Clackamas project, uh, we've had zero overflows, uh, not only there, but also uh, at the line where it comes down Portland Avenue at uh, Clackamas Boulevard there. That used to be a frequent location for uh, overflows right there. And we've had zero. Yeah, which is great news. Um, but DEQ would, they get involved when there's a reported overflow. Anytime a drop of sewage comes out of the pipe and hits it to our natural environment, it's a requirement to be reported. And then because of the number of instances, um, they try to work with an agency or a city. And if that uh, doesn't get them the results in the speed that they want, then they try, they move to this next level, which is a mutual agreement and order. Yeah. <laughs> and just for a little historical context, that I think was done in 2017, 18, it came to council and DEQ presented. And instead of us getting fines, we committed to a timeline and we have met all of those obligations. Our next one is finishing this project by January 2024. But to answer your question, Councillor Alexander, we are required to report to DEQ and provide updates. Okay, uh, so again, just uh, the East Basin, same level of projects. We've got some storm sewer extensions. You can see where we have emissions that we need to take off of the sanitary lines and get them or off the sanitary lines and get them onto existing or new storm sewer lines. So really we're just trying to get off the inflow sources from the city's sanitary system. <clears throat> This uh, this graph is is to demonstrate kind of the the illustration I talked about with the skateboard thing. Um, th this is what the industry has not only uh, seen and adopted, but it's what we've seen personally here in Western Oregon in terms of I and I projects or programs. There's only been a, a handful of successful I and I programs in Oregon, and they all have almost to the exact number of these percentages. So if we just rehabilitate just the sewer pipes themselves and the manholes, we see around a 20% reduction in those peak wet weather flows. If we start, if we do that and we add the laterals, the, the pipes coming from the individual homes, just to the edge of the right of way, we get that around double to around 40% of the reduction. When we do the laterals all the way up to as close to the building foundations as possible, we get to see around a 65% reduction. Um, so it, adding the laterals really gets a, a big reduction. Where that comes in to cost is probably what's most important for the city. Uh, let's just focus on the West Basin for now. These are huge dollars for the city of Gladstone, which is why we recommend do projects, the inflow projects that will be coming to you next month and then pause and, and reevaluate. But if we were to do the West Basin, um, you can see uh, just the first line in that first table, that $8.4 million is just to do the mains and the manholes. And we'll see around 1.3 million gallons of clean water per day come off during those peak wet weather events. And then the column to the right is the cost effectiveness. It's like that dollar per gallon removed. If we were to add the private laterals, uh, the, the building laterals to the edge of the right of way, we see that 40% reduction. It comes at an increased cost, but you can see the dollars per gallon removed go down. If we add it all the way to the building foundation, that's where we are most cost effective and you get your greatest reductions and your lowest dollars per gallon. So that would be the recommendation. It's almost better to do I&I &I in the West Basin and do all the private laterals to the building foundation before you even start on the East Basin, just because of that pure cost effectiveness. You, counselor. Sorry, you said something that raised a concern for me, which was there's only been a handful of successful I and I projects. So, how are we measuring success? Mm -hmm. Is the requirement from DEQ to try? Is it just to go through this program and make an attempt? Is there a specific success rate that we're shooting for? Can you explain what successful means and how we're going to measure success with this project? Yeah, uh, success I think is fulfillment of the mutual agreement and order, which ultimately means. Uh, no violations of the Clean Water Act. 
So no, no discharge of untreated sewage into the natural environment at any wet weather event less than a five year recurrence. Um, DEQ actually, uh, how do I say this? When I say there's only been a handful of, of successful programs is because there's only been a handful of programs that have been required by the state. Um, Oregon, just by nature of the age of a lot of our communities, we haven't had a huge I, &I issue the way that the East Coast of the United States, for example, has. Systems are much older, they're uh, much more deteriorated. There have been multi-billion dollar consent decrees out on the East Coast. They're starting to make their way out, eat out west as we start to age and our systems get older and more and more leaky. Um, so when I say there have been a handful of successes, it's every mutual agreement and order that I know of that's been I and I related has been fulfilled or is in the process of being fulfilled. I've worked on uh, uh, the fulfillment of a mutual agreement and order with I and I reduction in Sweet Home. So at the time, eleven thousand person community, they spent. $16 million, a huge investment for them. And this is in like the early 2010s. Uh, City of St. Helens fulfilled their mutual and agreement and order. So, so uh, I say that there's been a handful of success stories just because there's only been a handful of programs. No. Uh, I'm not going to go through the rest of this table if that's okay. No, I just okay. had one while we're yeah. talking on price. So are there not, if it's, if it's federally mandated also, is there not any federal program, Clean Water Acts, anything that, that we can get into or tap into to help us go with the $16 million one? There, there's actually a lot. Uh, it may not be as readily accessible, but over the last few years, there's been a tremendous amount of money pumped into our water and wastewater systems. I think the most recent bipartisan uh, infrastructure act there's actually gonna be additional money. There's certain size of community that might be eligible. I think Gladstone's too big to be eligible for some of the small community money, but um, we're helping the city of Sandy right now. They're in the same problem, but they actually own and operate their own treatment plant. They're a 13,000 person community. Uh, their program's $140 million for their wastewater program. And it's because a lot of that's in their treatment plant. So I think the city of Gladstone is in a great place where you, you're sending your flows to either Oak Lodge or, or West. You don't have to pay for these huge, huge treatment upgrades. Um, but they have DEQ loans um, that have really low interest rates, um, less than 2% right now, give, especially compared to what interest rates are now. Um, there's a a uh, federal loan program called the Water Infrastructure Finance WIFIA program. Um, and they do these really large hundred plus million dollar loans if necessary, but they do, they just start small community loans. So there's a lot of funding uh, opportunities out there. Our, our ARPA grants um, were, are huge. So you get grant money that you don't have to pay back. Um, uh, I would say the the primary funding source for most communities in Oregon is the Clean Water State Revolving Fund, and that is managed by DEQ. And uh, they just released something last month that are, they're offering like up to half a million dollars in principal forgiveness when you take one of their loans out. Um, so there's a lot of there's a lot of opportunities to pay for work. Hopefully. Yeah, knock on wood, these dollars aren't going to be something that the city has to pay for in short order. That uh, based on what Darren said, the work that, that the city's done already to date, plus this upcoming project, my hope is that you get really good gains out of that. And then you get continued year after year of not having overflows at the pump station. And so when you look at these big ticket items, keep in mind that we are going to do a pause before we even look at these big ticket items because, like just mentioned, we may be able to fix or address a lot of our issues through this program that we're doing right now, this contract. But in regards to the loans and grants, we're looking at those. Also keep in mind that sometimes DEQ reminds, requires your rates to be higher to pay those back. And so that is what we're trying to be very cognizant of is what can we afford to do with the modest utility rate increases that we're proposing. That's why utilizing ARPA funds for this program is really incredible for the community. Okay, I've just got to think a few more slides. I'll 
flow through really quickly. Uh, this is just an illustration of the West Basin. If we were to do holistic rehab, what we would be proposing is a mixture of trenchless technologies where we don't have to dig up the street. We can rehabilitate or renew the pipe without having to dig it up. There's a lot of great trenchless technologies out there. Some of the pipes are in such bad shape, we need to re replace them by traditional open cut excavation. So that's the difference in the colors here. But uh, to my earlier point, we would be recommending doing everything um, in the West Basin if necessary, if, if it gets to that point where you need to add another project. Uh, and that would include the laterals as well. Um, and then the East Basin, similar type graphic. Uh, and I think, uh, Councillor Garlington, the areas in red we highlight here are just showing those are not included in the project, that those need to be addressed by those private property owners because they're just too big. Um, recommended plan, uh, we're here at projects one and two. Uh, so it's the disconnection of inflow sources and the disconnection uh, uh, that requires storm sewer extensions um, with the hopes to bring forward a contract to approve uh, next month and construction begin this summer. And then again, that third line there, assessment one, that's the pause. Don't spend any more money until you know you have to. Then it would move into the West Basin, then another pause. Don't spend any more money until you know you have to, and then uh, address the East Basin. So this is the plan, uh, the plan that I think, uh, that I believe has been submitted to DEQ, which they now are saying, okay, great, that's, you've fulfilled, check that box off your mutual agreement and order, now do projects one and two. Um, and also remember that we entered into an agreement with Wes where they will reimburse us 33% of our costs for doing this project. So the good news is, is we have the funding to do projects one and two. Wes will also reimburse us 33%. We're almost at 100% of leeway doing the engineering designs so that Darren can go out to bid for a contractor, which we'll bring back to you July 11th, hopefully, but it may be August 8th, and then we start the work. I just wanted to add something. I, I think we've discussed this here, but um, I had West Board uh, Budget Committee meeting earlier this, this week, and, and I was reminded of it there. Uh, you mentioned it's possible for a treatment center to expand its capacity to handle water that intrudes into the system. Uh, but what West de determined was that that is far more expensive to do that kind of an expansion at that level than it is to than it is to prevent it from getting there in the first place, which is why they are saving money by investing in cities who are trying to reduce their I and I rather than just saying, okay, send it all our way. We'll just expand our capacity. Uh, so um, we're getting that help, which is good for us. It's also uh, overall a money saver for the whole system uh, because uh, cutting it off at the source is much better than just dealing with it once it gets there. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, and I, I remember Wes saying when they looked at their rates, uh, what they would have to then charge all of the regional entities contributing to their system, how much more that would have to go up because <laughs> everything would go up if they had to do what we call transport and treat, send it all and treat it all. Sorry. Councilor Reichel, you had a comment or a question? Yes, I have a quick question. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Um, just wanted to clarify, excuse me, that the extension, so the disconnection and extensions have to be completed by January of 2024. Is that correct? I believe that is the yeah. deadline that's written. In the <clears throat> that's what's agreement. in the, the mutual agreement and an order. Uh, we have been in contact with DEQ and they're fine as long as we're moving forward with everything. Uh, so if we do push out a little bit longer than January, they don't have an issue with it. Okay. I just was thinking because summer months, you know, might be easier to get that all done. I just didn't know. Do we have, we do, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I apologize. Uh, clarification also, do we have, these contracted already or were you saying that you're working on contracting these now currently we're still designing 
okay. everything to go out to bid. Uh, we're hoping to go out to bid uh, first part of next month okay. and then uh, hopefully bring a contract in July. Um, but if we don't make that, it would be the August uh, council meeting for a contract. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that. I appreciate it. Sorry about that. One more comment. You, you've um, you mentioned the EPA and the Clean Water Act a couple of times. Mm -hmm. uh, those laws and agencies didn't exist before about 1970. Right. So I understand that across the country, most people had combined systems. The stormwater and sewer were all one system. This is not something that's exclusive to Gladstone. Uh, it's it's everywhere. And I've read books about the Hudson River and places in New York and East Coast that all have the same issues. Um, does the age of the pipes then and, and the system uh, under which they were installed have a, a, does that correspond to where these problems exist? Do we have pre-EPA pipe systems that were never intended to separate the two, but are continuing to be combined then? Yeah, uh, a lot of our major metropolitan areas in the country still have combined sewers. Uh, Seattle does, Portland does. Um, most of the uh, cities, surrounding cities have entered into the modern age where they've separated their systems. Uh, I think some of the larger cities, just the, the infrastructure that would be required to separate is just was decided to be too costly. And so they still, some cities like Portland still maintain a combined system. So I would imagine, even though we have some homes and uh, here in Gladstone that were built in the twenties and the fifties, uh, a lot of the growth that we experienced in the, in the more recent decades were at a time when maybe we had a more enlightened approach to putting that, those systems in. Uh, we get good monthly reports from our public works department that often show photographs of uh, things that they discover that they didn't know were down there when they're working on something else, uh, places where the pipes intersect improperly. Uh, and, and, you know, we don't know who to blame for that because it might have been some developer decades ago. Uh, but, um, you know, I, I'm just grateful that we have a systematic approach to discovering these, these places. Um, I remember the week you were doing the smoke testing in my neighborhood because my four-year-old grandson was there and was fascinated to see smoke coming out of places. And I had a neighbor two doors down who had it coming out of the ground right off his front porch, mm -hmm. which meant he had you know, a sewer line going into the house that is going to need to be repaired. And a neighbor on the other side who had it coming out of his rain gutters, which meant that his stormwater system coming from his roof was going right into the sewer system. Yeah. And uh, the, the helpful people there explained all these, these meanings to me. I could interpret their results. So when I see these graphs and charts and showing all the spots, I think, oh, yeah, you know, that's what we were seeing. Now, the magnitude of it, the fact that it's three times more than you would normally see somewhere else. Well, I don't know if we have an explanation for that, but I am glad that we have a company with the experience to, you know, to know how to address it and in what order to do it. And to, uh, and, and, the, and the fact that we've already worked on some projects like down there on Clackamas Boulevard that have had such a big impact on, on the number, on the rate of these overflows already. Uh, so I am hopeful that when we get to that, when we put out these contracts, get that work done and get to that point where there's a pause, we will pause and, and you know, knowing that we have made some significant improvements. I, I, I'm really hopeful that that would be what, what, we, what we will find. Yeah, no, I, I am too. And I think the staff, uh, they've been just so amazing. Um, I think that's a big difference is uh, that I've seen in communities when they make this sort of progress is kind of more that proactive approach uh, where I think maybe decades of neglect had, had got us to the point we are now. So, um, yeah, I think the city's on, on a great path right now. And, and just one more thing for people that might be watching, because I know we have a huge audience for our work sessions. Um, <laughs> we've, we upped our rates five years ago or began the process of in, 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 increasing our rates. And I think there were people that expected, well, if you increase my rates, why don't I see these things being fixed? Mm. And you've explained tonight that there's a process. You know, you identify the problems, you engineer the solutions, then you contract and repair and make, the, you know, do the solution work. Uh, and in the meantime, the money accumulates to pay for those huge contracts that we're going to have to put out there to do it. Yeah. So I hope the public understands that we are not continuing to ignore this. We are definitely addressing it in ways that are kind of 
behind the scenes at this point, but will soon be very visible to the public. Um, right. Just so, so four, in four years, we got with you four years ago for your services and, and you've scoped and you've done the smoke and you've done it. So you've, you've figured out all the problems. And so are we going to, well, I guess I ask you, so we keep your company are we still? They are engineering the work for us. Right. But I mean, so after this, when we go one and two, and then it says, stop, take a break. Well, they, they will, same company will be monitoring, see how good we did. Or I mean, how's that work? That's what I'm asking. You, you detected the problems, but, and then are you done now or? We're contracted through projects one and two. Okay, um, that's what I was. Yeah. To and so, I mean, Wes does a lot of flow monitoring and modeling. Um, so, and given their interest uh, in this regional solution and their contributions to it, uh, I think there's a lot of different directions that the city could take in terms of the next, the reassessment number one, that the city could contract, the city could work with West to figure out who, who else could come in and do that work. Um, yeah, I'd be thrilled to continue to help. Uh, our, our firm would be thrilled, but um, ultimately what, whatever is best for the city is what we would want. Hey, thank you. Yeah. Councilor Garland. So my question is a little bit more back on this I and I remember when it happened. Um, if a house had a problem, had an issue, they had smoke, um, were they notified? Had the homes that have had issues on their property been notified that you have a problem? And the reason that I ask that is. I think if something came up at my house that that was something that needed to be fixed, I would fix it. Um, and so I think that that's a really important element. And the reason that I say that is rather than uh, going back after something that's already been looked at, we could potentially have uh, homeowners that are willing to fix their own problems if they knew that they were there. I mean, they could be have been at work and not seen that there was smoke somewhere. Is there a way for us to spend some money and notify homeowners that they had smoke on their property? Being proactive is what I'm thinking here. That would reverse a decision that a previous council has already made. Collectively, when we got the results, we said, let's go forward with the engineering, knowing that we are going to take care of it on the private property side of that. No, every, except for the SDA property, the ones that were identified there. Yes. So and anybody you know that how many there smoke. are private outside of the SDA, which was the majority of them. I can't remember the number on that. I know that number has shrunk considerably with reinvestigating and stuff like that. But I, I want to say there was private property. I want to say there was like, was it 50? Yeah, I was somewhere say, around 50. Yeah, 49 is the number that's in my head. So yeah. it's right around there. Um, there were some things that smoked, but they were meant to be there and just happened to have smoke come out. Uh, okay. Like a uh, grease trap, if folks know what that is coming out of a restaurant. Yeah. That is supposed to go into the sanitary sewers, but smoke came out probably because some, but they, it had a cover on it, not a big source of where a lot of rainwater was going to get in. So like that, we're able to eliminate and document for DEQ. Hey, this one was taken care of. Um, so any place there is smoke, we are taking care of it all, no matter the, the um, severity of the leak. That is correct. Okay. And it, it, becomes a, it becomes a fairness issue, too, if you have right. a property owner that goes out and fixes theirs and then they find out, well, they took care of everybody else. That's why the council as a whole said, let's use this ARPA money. Let's get these fixed. And then going forward, it's on them to, to do any repairs after that. But that was the notion is because then it's really hard for us to enforce the code for those that either chose to go do it themselves or how do you reimburse them? And that's why we said, this is a package. We're gonna get it engineered. We're gonna take care of the costs um, and haven't spent time trying to enforce our code, which property owners are required to right. take care of it themselves. But that will be something after the pause ongoing, then you have to enforce your code for that. Okay. I just, I couldn't remember if we had talked about everyone that had a problem getting fixed or 
you know, like your one through five kind of thing that you were talking about. I wanted to just make sure. And the reason why we needed that information when the decision was made so that Leeway could engineer it all as a package. And Administrator Betts, if I remember correctly, um, this was uh, not considered a pilot project, but a special exception because it's under within this mutual agreement and order with DEQ. Um, just thinking about the Oak Lodge system, and I've done work for Oak Lodge, they, they do worry that they have a lot of these types of connections or private sources of I, I getting into their system, both within their customers, but also Gladstone customers. So that's a whole other area of town. I don't believe that has been investigated to this level where smoke testing has been done. It might come up again. And I think the, if I rem recall the decision correctly, the council can point back and say, well, that was a, a regulatory requirement. So that's why we decided to, to fund all of it. The rest is just good work uh, that, that homeowners need to do to maintain their systems. And you should all be commended because you're being good stewards. This is what elected officials are supposed to do is take care of the citizens' needs for that. And so um, be proud. We appreciate your support. We're almost to a point where we can award the contract and get the work done. But it would be very easy for all of you to just put your head in the sand and say, not on my watch. But we're not doing that here. So Public Works has done an excellent job. Leeway, thank you for the work. Um, that you've put into this as well, but Gladstone can be part of that success program with the I and I. Well, I want to say too, it, it's great to have a city administrator who has been here long enough that she has the uh, you know institutional memory of why we made the decision we did to respond to Councilor Garlington's very good question. Mm -hmm. It puts it into context, and you know, engineering the whole thing is probably easier than. Uh, trusting individuals to to do it or allowing them and then having hard feelings if somebody does it and finds out their neighbor gets it free. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's not free for anybody. We've raised the rates in order to, to pay for this. So uh, everyone in the system is paying for everyone else in the system. Uh, and uh, these these problems, for the most part, are not the fault of the homeowner doing something. Uh, maybe somebody planted a tree without checking where the pipe was. I don't know, but that probably happens. But uh, we're, we're, we're accepting it collectively and working on it collectively, mm -hmm. which I, I think is helpful. So Mr. Lee, thank you for coming and sharing and uh, to your company for the work that you've done and continue to do. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'd ask just, I just but to your point, Mayor. Um, so not only if we fix all the homeowners for them and we got it, I mean, if we didn't say in those 50 or 49, it wouldn't let our percentage be up as high, would it? That, that would, would that be a factor in our overall success of, of what we were trying to achieve? Like if you didn't address those private sources right, at all and just right. let them be what they are, put the money and then we wouldn't have, we wouldn't get as good as a, a return on our investment. I yeah. Think, right? We okay. overuse the term too much low hanging fruit, but yeah. that is like literally the, it's like the fruit that fell into my basket. Um, <laughs> that's right. the stuff you want to take care of right away. All right. Thank you so much yeah. for your time. Thank you. All right, this has been a productive evening. Uh, I appreciate, uh, Darren, your input tonight. You were uh, on board for quite a bit of this and Tiffany as well. She's not here, but we are grateful to her. And uh, so next month we've got uh, a full agenda in June and um, I will accept a motion to adjourn the work session. So moved. Second. It had been moved by Councilor Huckabee, seconded by Councilor Alexander. Uh, Tammy, will you call the roll please? Councilor Garlington. Yes. Councillor Roberts. Yes. Councillor Cook. Yes. Councillor Reichel. Yes. Councillor Alexander. Yes. Councillor Huckabee. Yes. Mayor Milch. Yes. Meeting adjourned at 7.20 p.m. Thank you all. <laughs>